Hello, welcome everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'm Suzanne Wands. I'm the Executive Director of the Harvard Law School Library. And on behalf of the library, I'd like to welcome you all. And thank you very much for attending today's book talk on Professor Kennedy's latest book for discrimination, Race, Affirmative Action, and the Law, uh, which I am enjoying reading very much. And for any of you who haven't had the chance yet, there are copies in the back. Um, and Professor Kennedy will be available for signing after the talk. Um, so uh, I'd also like to thank the Dean's Office for the refreshments in the back. I hope you all will be able to enjoy them. And to June Casey, who has done a great job or organizing all of this. Thank you, June. <laughs> um, and I did want to let everyone know that uh, today's event is being taped. So if you ask any questions at the end, which I hope you will, uh, they'll be part of the audio recording. So I just want you all to be aware of that. And uh, without further ado, I will introduce our distinguished panel. Of course, we have in the middle Professor Randall Kennedy, who is the Michael R. Klein Professor of Law here at HLS. And then we have Professor Fallon, the Ralph S. Tyler Jr. Professor of Constitutional Law at HLS. And on the sneaking over here in the back, <laughs> Professor Charles Freed, the beneficial professor of law at HLS. Uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Professor Kennedy. Well, first of all, thank you very much. Thank you very much for um, affording me this uh, platform. I'm very flattered. And uh, thank all of, I'd like to thank all of you all for showing up. Um, just a couple of words, because I'm, I'm very anxious to hear from my colleagues here. Um, the, one of the happiest moments in uh, writing a book is frankly at the end uh, <laughs> when it comes time for, for two things. There are two things that um, um, bring me much happiness. One is the um, uh, acknowledgments page. And in the acknowledgments page, I like that so much because I have a chance to acknowledge all the many people who have helped in these, um, you know, in this, in this project. And it's usually pretty, it's a, it's a couple pages long because there are a lot of people who, who help. Uh, my colleagues help. We're going to hear from two of my colleagues. My colleagues are extremely, uh, extremely patient, ex extremely, um, they're just, they're, they're great sounding boards. Uh, in the course of the past two years when I was writing this book, uh, I talked to Dick Fallon and, and Charles Freed, you know, not on one occasion but on many occasions, uh, and other colleagues as well. But there's one group of people in particular who I uh, mention in the acknowledgments and who really go just way beyond the call of duty uh, in being helpful, certainly in my projects, and that's the reference librarians. Um, the reference librarians. <laughs> The reference librarians not only um, with you know, great expertise um, answer questions and get virtually anything that anybody could you know, sort of think to uh, ask for, but the reference librarians go beyond that. Um, if I, when I'm working on a, a, a project, the reference librarians know about the project and constantly point out things. Have you seen this article? Have you seen this book? Have you seen this? Have you seen the other? And it's really a quite extraordinary thing, and I am deeply, deeply grateful. Um, the other page that I like is the, um, the dedication page. And um, the dedication page usually goes, in, in all my other books, it's gone to various relatives. On this occasion, I dedicate the book to two of my teachers. One of those teachers is um, the great historian Eric Foner, um, whom I met when I was an undergraduate. The other teacher was a person who actually introduced me to Eric Foner. He's a person who is part of this community. Uh, he's a person that I've known now for over 40 years and has been absolutely unstinning in his support on my behalf. And he's here, and I'm very happy to see him. And Sandy Levinson, thanks for coming.
um, about the book. So I'm just going to say a little bit because I'm so anxious to hear from Dick and Charles. The book is about the affirmative action controversy. And boiled down to its essentials, I, take, I, I, I try to make two points. One, insofar as the um, legal controversy, um, I don't think, frankly, that there ought to be a big legal controversy about racial affirmative action. I think that the Supreme Court of the United States has put a constitutional cloud over affirmative action that does not belong there. I think that there are a whole set of arguments that justify racial affirmative action um, that should suffice um, uh, to, to, to justify um, racial preferences as they are typically deployed uh, in American life, in higher education, and in other spheres, though I focus mainly on higher education. It seems to me that the argument for um, rectification, compensatory justice should suffice, the argument for integration should, should suffice, the argument for um, diversity in higher education should suffice. All of these things, it seems to me, make an easy argument in justification of affirmative action as a constitutional matter. I think a closer issue has to do with the policy debate. Um, I think that there are um, good arguments for affirmative action, but I also make a point of uh, saying throughout my book that affirmative action does come with a cost. Uh, I think that, um, you know, does affirmative action stigmatize to some degree uh, the putative beneficiaries? Ain't my answer, yes. Uh, does it generate um, resentments in our society? Yes. Um, uh, is there a problem of allocation with respect to racial affirmative action, particularly with respect to higher education? Um, yes. I mean, after all, the people who were benefited by affirmative action in higher education are typically the more well-off people in uh, minority communities. I mean, after all, if you're a plausible candidate for admission, for admission to, let's say, the University of Michigan Law School or the, uh, a medical school uh, in a, a public university, if you're in a position to be a plausible candidate for something like that, you're doing pretty well. That means you're a college graduate. That means you've done you know, pretty well. Why is it that we spend so much time and attention on those people as opposed to, let's say, people who don't make it out of high school or people who make it out of high school but are still functionally illiterate. So it seems to me that the question of how you allocate your political energy is a real issue, and I think that that's going to be an even more pressing issue in the years to come. Um, and I, you know, I, think that, I think those are close questions. And I try to explore those uh, in the book, but I don't think that the legal question, as far as I'm concerned, should be close. Um, I think I'm a, I think I'm going to subside here, and uh, I'd like to hear from uh, my colleagues. Uh, this is a wonderful book, and it is a wonderfully open-minded book. If I have a criticism, and that's the one I'm going to voice, it is <laughs> that it does not make the argument against affirmative act, doesn't make what I think is the strongest argument against affirmative action that can be made. And it's the one that troubles me. So let me read to you a statement of that argument by my favorite author on this issue. Here it is. A well-ordered multiracial society ought to allow its members free entry into and exit from racial categories, even if the choice they make clash with traditional understanding of who is black and who is white, and even if, despite such choices in good faith, individuals mislead observers who rely on conventional racial signaling. Rather than seeking to bind people forever 
to the racial classifications into which they are born, we should try both to eradicate the deprivations that make some want to pass and to protect individuals' racial self-determination, including their ability to revise stated racial identities. Now that's on a passage from Passing by uh, racial, uh, Randy Kennedy. <laughs> 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 and I think that's what's at the heart uh, of this issue. It is, to my mind, uh, as it was to Randy in that book, a question of individual liberty, the ability of people to define themselves and to define who they are. Now, a uh, fair point, and a point that Randy makes, and it's, a, it, it's an obvious point, and it's completely true, is, oh yeah, that's all very well and good, but given the history of, sa uh, of, of uh, slavery and Jim Crow and discrimination and the discrimination that exists even now, uh, those things are the things that trap people in an identity. And the whole point of affirmative action is to allow uh, people to escape from that. In my view, uh, there was a famous thing that uh, Bill Clinton said when he was describing his, ca uh, his cabinet. He said he wants his cabinet to look like America. My view is we will have solved this problem when not the cabinet, but families look like America. We're moving in that direction. But we can't possibly move in that direction uh, without the kind of contact, without the kind of presence in our midst of, of black people mainly, but of other minorities, uh, without that presence, which affirmative action grants. So affirmative action is the necessary condition for the goal which Randy states and which I've just read to you. My problem is this. We, it is, uh, at the time of the Grutter decision, uh, that was 25 years after Bakke. Uh, and in that decision, Justice Ginsburg uh, noted, said that, fine, this is very important. We've got to do this, but of course, it can't last forever. Why can't it last forever? Because if the remedial goal of affirmative action lasts too long, question, how long is too long, lasts too long, then it will become a new trap and a new uh, societal definition of who we are. And that will be race. It'll be in the politics. It'll be in the business. There will be bureaucracies. They will have a the whole affirmative action bureaucracies. They will have a vested interest in their continuation forever. There will be racial entrepreneurs like the despised by me, Jesse Jackson, uh, and they will want to maintain their power and their constituency, forced constituency, forever, and that's very bad. So you want this somehow to wind down. Now, Justice Ginsburg recognized all this, and what she said is, yes, it's got to stop, at some point, 25 years. Well, 25 years plus 25 years is 50 years. That's a very long time. That's between two and three generations. And I worry, I worry that three or four generations of racial classifications, for benign purposes to be sure, will not fix us 
and will not work against the goal which Randy so eloquently put in this earlier book. Okay, well, th uh, thank you. Uh, I'm just absolutely delighted to be here and delighted to be celebrating uh, this book. I don't think I probably will be informing anybody in this room with something he or she didn't know when I say that Randy is an absolute personal, uh, institutional, and even national treasure. It's been just a wonderful delight to have known him over a period of, what, approaching 40 uh, years and to have been talking uh, to him about issues of this kind uh, for those 40 years. He is just the best combination that I could imagine uh, of somebody who is honest, uh, intellectually searching, uh, and provocative. And it's hard to be all of those things at once, uh, but he combines those three qualities of honesty, uh, intellectual searchingness, and provocativeness uh, in just an unparalleled way in my experience. Uh, I enjoyed the book. I like the book. There's almost nothing in the book uh, that I am disposed to disagree uh, with. Uh, when I read a book like that, I often say to myself, well, I wish I had written that book. Um, <laughs> but in this case, I couldn't have written this book. Nobody but Randy could have written uh, this uh, book. Uh, it's just full of little gems of uh, sides of insight uh, that are quintessential Randy Kennedy. So I don't have a lot to disagree uh, with, and I should say something that should try uh, to provoke some conversation. And so uh, to try to say something to provoke a little bit of conversation, I just want to talk about who I imagine the audience for this book uh, to uh, be. And when I try to imagine the audience for the book, I imagine that the audience is very much uh, people such as those in this room here now, people who who come uh, from elite institutional backgrounds and who are concerned about policy at a very high level of generality rather uh, than at a more specific uh, one. And so, for example, just a little bit of bite uh, to this, I find the book fascinating and provocative. Uh, I expect it would be no help whatsoever to somebody who wanted to defend affirmative action in a public political uh, forum uh, in a situation in which, for example, a state of California by referendum uh, has abolished affirmative action in education uh, and the state of Michigan uh, has done the same. So we start with for discrimination. Uh, for discrimination, something that seems to be looking to invite uh, controversy uh, and to put people uh, off. For people such as us, it's a shock. The shock um, draws us in. Uh, once drawn in, we are persuaded uh, by the arguments. But if you look at poll uh, numbers, if you ask on the national scale, according to the Gallup uh, poll, are you in favor of racial preferences in uh, university admissions, um, or do you think that uh, university admissions should be done totally on a merit uh, basis, uh, you get uh, over 67% of people saying uh, solely on a merit basis, only 28% uh, uh, want to have race come into the picture. Now, you can ask the question in different ways. Uh, a huge amount in terms of the way the polling comes out depends uh, on how you put the question. Uh, but I take it that the, Randy's not interested in uh, affecting that public political debate in a large way. He's even willing to say things that might be um, embarrassing to the people who would be on his side in that public uh, political uh, debate because he wants to talk to us rather than to uh, influence that debate uh, directly. Now, the second uh, thing I have in mind when I say I think he's talking to people uh, like us is I think he is talking to people like us who are uh, members of elite institutions. And so when he talks uh, about uh, affirmative 
um, action. Uh, he, uh, his longest uh, imagined colloquy in the book uh, is with someone uh, named Richard Sander, who believes that we have too much affirmative action at elite institutions, uh, and the result is detrimental in the sense that we get uh, larger numbers of racial minorities in elite institutions than ought to be uh, the case, and there are fewer uh, further down uh, the line. So in this colloquy, uh, Randy takes Sanders' figures. Sanders uh, estimates that in the absence of affirmative action, the percentage of African Americans in elite institutions uh, would diminish from somewhere in the vicinity of 8 to 9 percent uh, on average to something closer to 1 to 2 uh, percent uh, on average. Uh, and Randy, if I understand him uh, correctly, wants to say the last line in the book, uh, that to have that kind of decline at the elite institutions would be calamitous. It would be a very, uh, it would be a very bad uh, thing. Now, Sander thinks that it wouldn't be a bad uh, thing uh, because he thinks what would happen, as I say, is if we had fewer than 8 or 9% of uh, African American representation in elite uh, institutions. Uh, it's you go further down the pecking order from elite to less uh, elite, there would be more representation of African Americans further down the line. So I did just some quick, dirty uh, Google research. But if you go uh, to uh, American colleges uh, rated uh, 40, number 40 and below, uh, then you start to find a huge fall off in number of African Americans uh, who are there. And presumably, some of that is because there are, as Sanders says, uh, people who, if they weren't admitted to elite institutions, the most elite uh, institutions would be going uh, to these uh, institutions further down uh, the line. So when I say it's a book pitched to people like us, it's book pitched to people like us uh, in our elite institutions. It's really important to maintain affirmative action in the elite institutions. Uh, but if we were talking about, and these, I come from the state of Maine, and so when I was doing my quick, uh, dirty research, I was looking at Colby Bates Bowden. Uh, if we're talking about the Colby Bates Bowdens of the world, it's harder for them to do affirmative action uh, now. Uh, and so I take it that this, what, what this is about is affirmative action in elite institutions rather than a general argument about the way education ought to be structured in the United States uh, from the top to the bottom. So for us, elite institutions, it's important for us in elite institutions to do this. It doesn't matter so much uh, if other institutions in the society do uh, it. And then I third thing uh, about people uh, like um, us, it operates at a very high level of generality. It's not terribly uh, interested in institutional detail, as I read it, about how uh, affirmative action programs ought to be structured. He says uh, repeatedly that there are a lot of bad affirmative action programs uh, out there. There are people who advocate uh, doing stupid things. I think that's a typical Randy uh, Kennedy uh, locution. He's not for anybody doing anything stupid, uh, but he's not, he, he doesn't really get into the detail of how uh, affirmative action programs ought to be run as a policy matter. I actually want to agree with Randy when he divided things at the beginning between the constitutional question and the policy uh, question, and everything that I'm saying speaks to the policy question rather uh, than the constitutional uh, question. Uh, but it strikes me that how to organize an affirmative action program in institutional detail would be a very complicated uh, question. And so one thing that's very striking about the book, about the affirmative action debate in the country, is it often occurs as if the debate uh, is about what uh, to do uh, with regard to affirmative action or no affirmative action for African Americans. In 1960, uh, African Americans were a little over 90 percent of the total minority population in the United States, the total non-white uh, population in the United States. Uh, today, African Americans are only about 45 percent of the non-white population in the United States. And so if you were thinking about the institutional details 
of how to organize an affirmative action program, then you would want to be concerned, I think, to some uh, very considerable extent about the ways in which paradigmatic African-American uh, disadvantage does or does not generalize uh, to other racial minorities and think about how you would want to take that uh, into account in designing an affirmative action program. Now, if you'd written that book, I wouldn't have been very interested in those things myself. I'm not somebody who wants to get into all the nitty gritty of institutional uh, details, but I just make this as my last point as a way of um, generalizing rounding out the general theme that I meant to be uh, develop about to be developing about what kind of book this is and for whom it is written uh, as what it is it could scarcely be better uh, but um, it speaks to a particular kind of audience and ignores some others okay. just a couple of uh, responses and then let's open this thing up um, first um, with respect to uh, uh, Charles Freed's uh, reference to an earlier book, you know, one of the things that uh, one of the things that drew me to this subject is that I've 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 changed over time. So I think there are going to be some readers of this book who are going to be actually rather surprised that in this book I am such a strong proponent of affirmative action because in previous writings I have um, I've, I think I've always on balance been in favor of affirmative action but in previous writings I've been a lot more hesitant there's been a real you know it's uh, sort of okay but it's with, it was with clenched you know teeth um, this time I'm much more strongly um, in favor of affirmative action. And frankly, I, I had hoped that in writing the book, it, there would be some point at which I would be able to s explain clearly why that is so. Um, I'm, not st I'm still not sure about that, actually, why that is so. Um, it is so, but I'm not altogether sure um, why it is so. Um, Charles, when you, I, I still believe what I said about individual liberty. I, d I do believe very strongly that people should be able to define themselves how they want to be defined. And in fact, I believe that so strongly that if it were the case that um, the, that sustaining affirmative action, perpetuating affirmative action in the future required more policing of the race line, if that were a requirement, I think I, I would be so appalled by that that it would change my, I, 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 I would be, I don't know how, where I would stand with respect to that. That would be such a cost that it might cause me to say that's, that's, that costs too much. So for instance, uh, a couple years ago here, there was a Native American student who wrote an open letter to our admissions office. And the Native American student said, listen, uh, the only, you know, I'm Native American. I come from a reservation. I know a few other Native American students here. The other Native American students I know here are only Native American during the 10 minutes or whatever, how long it, ever how long it took for them to write their application. They were Native American when they checked the box. Otherwise, they weren't Native American. And she objected to this, and she said, I think that the admissions officials here at Harvard Law School should police this. And um, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know. I've never talked with the, the hires up. I've never talked with, the, with the, the powers that be. I feel very confident that that is not policed. I feel very confident that the way it works here is the way it works at m m most institutions, which is a sort of, um, you know, sort of deference to however, you know, good faith. Whatever you say you are, you are, and then we just will go on about our business. Um, even to the extent of swallowing what some people might view as racial fraud. I think that many institutions have said, even if there's racial fraud, we would rather have that 
than have a close policing, you know, who's your father, who's your mother, how thick are your lips, what's the texture of your hair. I mean, you know, there was a time in American life where there was lots of litigation over what's your race. I think that there's a general feeling now that, you know, we want to repudiate that. And I think that's right. And so um, if affirmative action required stronger policing, then I might be against it. The fact of the matter is, though, interestingly enough, it has not required uh, stronger policing. There's only one context in which this is not true. So for instance, there are people in jails across the United States, entrepreneurs who have said that they were the owners of minority companies, and that turned out to be a sham. Those people have been prosecuted. But outside of that context, with respect to workplaces, with respect to educational institutions, in the United States, we've generally had a, uh, you know, a, a very, there, there has been no policing. And I think that's, that's right. Um, Dick, on your comments about audience, you're exactly correct. I mean, in all the books I've written, my audience, my, my sort of, you know, my, Who's my audience? My audience are the people that I see here day in and day out. The fact of the matter is, all these books have been tested on um, captive audiences known as classes. <laughs> and um, the, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's the people that I see day in and day out that are the, you know, that, that's who I have in mind insofar uh, as these books go. Um, am I elitist? Yeah, I am elitist, you know, in, in, in a variety of ways, um, uh, including the way that you suggested. So, for instance, um, one of my defenses of affirmative action against critics both on the left and on the right, because on the the critics on the left and the right sometimes uh, they sound very similar, I mean, uh, with respect to this. They, you know, there's a, there's a right-wing attack on affirmative action for being elitist. Uh, and there's a left-wing attack on affirmative action for being elitist. One of the things, you know, I say is, well, you know, the fact of the matter is elites are extraordinarily important in American society. Take a look at the Supreme Court of the United States. The Supreme Court of the United States is peopled by jurists who have gone to two law schools. <laughs> two. So, I mean, if you're talking about you know, the importance of elite institutions, the Supreme Court of the United States has nine people on it, all of whom went to either Yale or Harvard Law School. Uh, you know, and, 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 and so elites are very important and you know, the, we're, we're still in the midst of desegregating American elites, and that's why I think that affirmative action, even though it's limited, and even though there is this class tilt, uh, it's for that reason that I, you know, would defend it. Finally, with respect to your last comment, Dick, about you know, this being it pitched at a rather, you know, sort of a, a higher level of abstraction, not getting down into the nitty gritty. I actually view that as something of a weakness. Um, I have a colleague in the room, we were talking the other day, Justin Driver, said to me, he said, you know, I liked your book, but I would have liked it even more, because there are a couple of times when I say, you know, I'm for sensible affirmative action, of course, if I'm for sensible affirmative action, that's saying implicitly I'm against stupid affirmative action. <laughs> and, 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 and Justin Driver said, well, you know, I would, have, I, I would have liked to have heard a little bit more about some stupid affirmative action. You know, give me some names. Um, and actually, I think I've, that's good. Um, within two months, I've got to write a new forward for the paperback. And that's going to be one of the things I do. I think it would benefit by a bit more institutional particularity. And you know, I'm going to endeavor to provide that particularity in, uh, in, a, in a, you know, the paperback edition. So with that, floor is open, comments, questions, and by all means, objections. Because I would think that in an audience like this, you know, there are going to be differences of opinion. So 
The floor is open. Yeah, shoot. Sure. Um, these are two questions that are geared towards fleshing out those institutional details. I'll just start by saying I'm half Latino, half Asian. So I've been told on multiple occasions that I, I'm in a weird position because affirmative action is both for and against me. Um, uh, so my first question would be, how would you adjust sort of our sort of current conception of affirmative action programs um, in order to make room for Asian Americans who while getting better grades, still suffer from problems with immigration and also has also has a history of, of discrimination here in the US. And then secondly, the same kind of question for people like me who are biracial, multiracial, and, and sort of the growing body of this, that sort of represent the blurring of these racial categories. Okay. As far as I'm concerned, the um, the whole the the affirmative action apparatus should be regulated by, should be regulated in a decentralized way by regular politics. We live in a huge country uh, where different communities are situated very differently. So in this huge country, we have some sectors of the Asian American community that are doing very well and are, you know, frankly, in no real need of a helping hand. On the other hand, there are certain you know, sectors of the country where you have Asian American communities that are definitely in need of a helping hand. And if, if, you know, if I were king, um, I like that. <laughs> if I were king, I would allow um, you know, different um, jurisdictions to handle different communities uh, in different ways. Uh, depending on need. The one thing that I would, I would not allow, so, you know, I, I say that this should be handled by regular politics. What I mean by that is every year, you know, when, when we have an affirmative action controversy that goes to the Supreme Court of the United States, typically you have a person in the big Supreme Court cases, it's always been a white person, you know, Alan Bakke, Gratz, Gruder, the reverse discrimination cases have always involved, you know, white people who were disappointed. They didn't get into some place where they wanted to get into. You know, I'm, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I am. I'm sorry about. It. I mean, I'm sure. You know, I'm, 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 not, I'm not being facetious here. I'm sure that you know people really worked hard. Um, and what they do is they come in and they say, you know, I'm the victim of reverse discrimination. Do I think that a white person could be the victim of reverse discrimination? Yeah, I think a white person could be the victim of reverse discrimination. And if a white person was, came to me and said, there's an institution, there's a public institution that discriminated against me or excluded me um, because I'm white and because this institution wanted to stick it to me because I'm white, because this institution sort of um, uh, had, a, um, had an animus against me or didn't take the interests of my group, you know, as seriously as they take the interests of some other group. Um, if you could say anything like that, prejudice against whites, animus against whites, uh, disgust of whites, the, so, the, you know, the sort of thing that was so abroad not so long ago in the United States with respect to people of color. Sometimes, especially with students, it it's always gets to me. You know, I see we, we talk, you know, people talk about you know, Jim Crow segregation. And you, you know, I, you know, you, I look at the class, and the class is looking at me like I'm talking about you know, the fall of ancient Carthage. <laughs> I'm not that old. And I saw the, you know, I saw Jim Crow segregation. I begin the book by talking about, I'm from Columbia, South Carolina. You know, I, 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 I sat in the Jim Crow section of a, of a movie theater. It's not that, you know, it's, my mother was, grew up a stone's throw away from the University of South Carolina. That's where, you know, it would have been very easy. She could have lived at home and gone to the University of South Carolina. Of course, she couldn't go to the University of South Carolina. She had to go to South Carolina State. The University of South Carolina was, you know, for, for, for white people. We're not talking about something way long time ago. But 
that, that was invidious discrimination. I'm against invidious discrimination no matter who the target is. White people, Asian American people, black people. I'm against invidious discrimination. Affirmative action as characteristically practiced in the United States is not invidious discrimination against white people or any other people. Asian Americans, so I've been on a book tour. I, you know, I was in California two weeks ago. This came up a, a, a lot. People say, well, you know, what about Asian Americans? I'd say, listen, if you can show me a policy that invidiously discriminates against Asian Americans, I'm against that policy. On the other hand, if, you, if, if all you can say to me is this is a governmental policy that disadvantages my group, if that's all that you can say to me, I don't think you have a constitutional claim. The government is disadvantaging groups all the time. It shouldn't be able to invidiously disadvantage a group, but if, the, if a group is just merely disadvantaged because the government is a, trying to accomplish a mission that the government ought to be able to accomplish, I see no problem. So if it's the case that a group is disadvantaged uh, in an effort whereby our representatives are seeking to overcome our heritage of you know, past racial oppression, as far as I'm concerned, everybody should participate in that. Black people, white people, Asian American people, Native American people, anybody. Just, you know, that's, that's just one of the things that we do it being part of this particular polity. So I don't, you know, as far as I think that if Asian Americans, you know, groups need, need of help, help them. If they are disadvantaged collaterally, they're just disadvantaged collaterally. We're, you know, all sorts of people are disadvantaged um, collaterally. <laughs> On this issue of, well, you know, where do I check the box? Um, check the box how you want to check the box. I'm not... You know, I'm, I'm not really all that concerned about it. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on socioeconomic or SES-based affirmative action. Um, you were talking about the letter from the Native American student talking about how the Native Americans here aren't truly Native American, this idea of an authentic minority experience, which would be, I guess, a disadvantaged experience. You hear the same comments being made about the African American or Latino populations that are here, that they're not necessarily disadvantaged, that they don't need the help, and so it should be SES-based rather than race-based affirmative action. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I mean, it seems to me it, it's, it's all a matter of what you're trying to accomplish. I don't think that affirmative action, racial affirmative action, I don't think, you know, racial affirmative action can accomplish, you know, it's, it's not a magic bullet. Uh, racial affirmative action uh, is a type of redistribution, but it's a very limited type of redistribution. I think it's a mistake for people to think that racial affirmative action is going to address the problem of just general disadvantage in American life. There are all sorts of, dis there's, there's all sorts of inequities in American life. There's class inequity in American life, and if what you're after is addressing class inequity in American life, well then, address class directly. And by the way, I think we ought to. You know, there are a lot, there are, there are a lot of poor white needy people in America. And um, I'm all for, Trying to assist them. Um, but class disadvantage is not the same as racial disadvantage. Sometimes they overlap, but sometimes they don't. Um, and I think it's a mistake to conflate the two. Um, we have a class problem in America. We have a race problem in America. Instead of stamping out racial affirmative action in order to get at class, you know, um, fairness, there are people. Let me put it like this. And here, I, I, I try not. I, I try not to be ad hominem in in argument, but there is a, there is one place where I do get ad hominem. There is one place in particular where I do get ad hominem. So, there are some people 
who, in attacking racial affirmative action, say the real problem is poor racial minorities and poor white people. You know, that's the real problem. And the, you know, this racial affirmative action helps out you know, sort of you know, these black middle class people. The only time, and some, there's some people who say that, the only time I ever hear them say anything that smacks of an egalitarian impulse, the only time is when they are attacking racial affirmative action. <laughs> That's the only time. After they attack racial affirmative action, they don't have poor people on the backsides of their minds. Uh, and, you know, I, I, um, I think, that's, I think they're, they're using the rhetoric of, you know, using egalitarian rhetoric against a moderate form, in my view, of redistribution. And, you know, I think people ought to be attentive to that and watchful of that. Um, so I'm all for supplementing racial affirmative action with deeper and broader forms of social reform in American life. But I, in, in, in getting to those reforms, I do not want to get rid of a reform which over the past you know, 30 to 40 years has, in my view, you know, really benefited, uh, been of tremendous benefit to America. Yeah. Um, excuse me. You talked a little bit about uh, elite institutions being important and the need to desegregate these elite institutions. Is there some work that that desegregation should be doing? Should we see different outcomes within elite institutions? Or is it just that we need a representational equality, even if the outcomes don't change, even if the people who desegregate make the same choices or commit the same actions as the people who would have been there otherwise? Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, two things. Number one, I think that changing the personnel uh, typically does change the, you know, the calculations, does change the actions. But frankly, I would say even if that were not so, you know, even if that were not so, um, I would still be for the change. So, you know, in the past, you know, the United States has had a really interesting experiment over the past six years with a chief executive who's black. And there's some people who criticize that chief executive who's black and is a Harvard Law School alum. Um, because they say, well, you know, geez, he sort of acts like, you know, he's not all that, he's not all that different, for goodness sakes. And he sort of, you know, he's, he looks different, you know, but he's not all that much different. And there's some people who are really quite critical of him. As far as I'm concerned, let's stipulate that he would not do anything different than, you know, let's create a white chief executive. In my view, the fact, even if everything he's done would be exactly the same as the white chief executive, tremendous change psychologically in America. And I think that one of the important things that's happened over the past you know, couple of decades with respect to institutions like this one is at a level that's hard to quantify, but I think it's quite real. And that's at the level of symbolism, and that's at the level of psychology. And so even if it were the case that, you know, geez, Kennedy, um, all that's happened is a desegregation of elite institutions, and these elite institutions have just punched out, uh, you know, darker colored versions of, uh, you know, darker colored establishmentarians, I'd say, OK, I don't think that's the case. But even if that is the case, given what's happened in the United States, given where we come from, that in and of itself, as far as I'm concerned, is you know, quite a change. Well, that's the Randy Kennedy that I quoted from at the beginning 
uh, of the talk. Just think how deplorable it would be if having had an affirmative action program at a place like Harvard, uh, the affirmative action program we had, we then went on with a different kind of policing and said, we're only going to take you if you agree to uh, go into public interest law. That would be awful. You, what you want to do is when you bring someone here, have that person have the same opportunities and the same freedom as the other people we bring here. That's, of course, what this Randy Kennedy uh, was saying. Uh, and I think that's really very, uh, very important. Yes. Um, you mentioned that a lot of the only cases that have really come um, on the subject are from white people being disappointed. Is there a case that you would like to see? You, you mentioned that in the opposite case. Is there a case you'd like to see come before the, the Supreme Court or a case you'd like to imagine that isn't disappointed white people? Well, first of all, with respect to this Supreme Court, I'd like to see as few cases as possible. <laughs> um, if we could, if we, you know, if, if we could send, if we could send this Supreme Court on a, a nice vacation for a few years, that would be fine by me. Um, I thought, in all seriousness, I thought in the last, you know, um, one problem I had with this book, For Discrimination, and by the way, the title, For Discrimination, it's not actually my title. What happened was, I, so I wrote the book. I had some long, you know, working title. The book gets finished, and then it's time for a real title. I, could, I, I didn't have any real title. And the publisher basically said, you know, my editor said, hey, we need a title. You know, it, it, the time has come. And... It was my editor, a guy named Errol McDonald, the person who actually got me into writing books, uh, who came up with for discrimination. And initially, I didn't like it, because I thought, you know, nah, this isn't going to be good. Because of course, discrimination has a very negative connotation, generally, which is, of course, why he put it forward. Because you know he's, he's part of the Random House Empire. They want to sell books, for goodness sakes. But it's grown on me. I kind of I like the title now. But one of the problems with book publishing is that um, it still takes a long time for books to be published. I mean, the gestation period of a, of a book, even of a commercial publisher, I mean, Pan Pantheon's you know, part of the Random House Empire, it's still seven to nine months. So this case, this um, Fisher case, was coming down the pike. And I, I called up the editor. I said, hey, listen, um, I'm really worried about this because it's a major case that's coming. Can you just produce the book and leave, let's say, five pages blank <laughs> so that when the case come da comes down, you give me five pages? And I, can only, and I can only work within five pages. And the answer came back, no. Can't do it. So in the book, I, the, what I was forced to do was say, OK, this is what I described the case. And I said, this is what I think is going to happen. But I did not, I, I wrote the book without having the benefit of the Fisher case. Well, now I have the benefit of the Fisher case. And one of the most striking things about Fisher versus the University of Texas is an absence. The Supreme Court of the United States is dealing with the legitimacy of a racial line in terms of admission at the University of Texas. The Supreme Court writes, Justice Kennedy writing for the Supreme Court, and there is a case that is missing. There is a case that is missing. What's the case that's missing? The Supreme Court of the United States does not mention does not mention the case Sweat versus Painter. Sweat versus Painter is the 1950 case in which a black man, Heman Sweat, sought admission to the University of Texas. 
the dean of the University of Texas writes to him and says, you've got a really good record. And you would be admitted if you were eligible. But you're not eligible because you're black. Very straightforward. I got to give the dean credit. No hiding of the ball there. <laughs> the Supreme Court of the United States says, well, we still, you know, we're, we still uphold segregation. We still uphold separate but equal. The, but we're going we're to require him to be admitted because there is no separate but equal law school in Texas. So since you don't have a separate but equal law school, we're going to tell this guy that he can go to the white law school. But the point is, this was 1950. You would have thought that the Supreme Court would have mentioned this case. And you would have also thought it because Heman Sweat's relatives had a lawyer submit a brief on behalf, essentially, of the, you know, the memory of Heman Sweat. The fact that the Supreme Court of the United States did not even mention this, it seems to me, frankly, is scandalous. And one of the things that I wanted to do in this book was put on the table arguments that the Supreme Court of the United States has put out of bounds. So the Supreme Court of the United States has basically said, with respect to higher education, all you can talk about is diversity. You cannot talk about rectification. You cannot talk about integration. You cannot talk about things that seem to me we should talk about. The Supreme Court changes over time. There may come a time, a few, you know, there, there, there's going to be a change in personnel. And there might be a change in personnel such that in a few years, some of the arguments that are now off limits will have a new opportunity to be heard. And when that time comes, I want these arguments to be heard. And I saw it as you know, an opportunity to maybe put these arguments back on the radar screen. Listen, thank you very much for coming.